So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, the uh, invitation. Uh, it's for me the first time that I have the opportunity uh, to speak for a uh, European Chamber of Commerce. And I'm very pleased that I can do that in, in Hong Kong. It's not the first time that I'm coming in Hong Kong. I was here last time in 2005, uh, I, I, I think. Uh, and, uh, and for me, it's the is third time. So the European Union, and uh, particularly the member states, ladies and gentlemen, of the uh, euro area, are in great trouble. That is uh, the last, what we can say, about, uh, for about two years now, uh, we are facing and we are challenging uh, a debt crisis uh, in Europe, a debt crisis that is challenging Europe, but also, I think, the future of the European Union. Uh, since the outbreak of the so-called Greek crisis in December 2009, followed, as you know, by a, a Portuguese financial crisis in 2010, and also an Irish crisis uh, earlier this year. So the euro area is confronted, uh, we can say, uh, with the most severe test uh, since uh, the birth of the European Union. Yet we have to recognize uh, today that the seven, uh, 27 member states of the Union and certainly the 17 member states of the Eurozone still fail uh, to combat the crisis effectively as we are still confronted uh, with faltering stock markets, growing debts and also rating agencies, downgraded, uh, downgrading banks and countries alike. And so let me, first of all, uh, in this intervention, answer the question, yes, what went wrong? Uh, what is happening uh, for the moment? We launched the euro uh, in the beginning of 2001. We have never seen what we have seen today. What went wrong? First of all, I think that we have made uh, a strategic mistake at the beginning when we uh, launched the euro. We launched a monetary union, but uh, we did not install an economic union and a fiscal union alike. And today we know that all this is impossible. A, a single currency with uh, 17 different governments, 17 different bond markets and 17 different economic strategies can simply not work. Nevertheless, the European decision makers about 10 years ago thought that it was possible, that it was possible to introduce a single European currency without the necessary means and instruments to do so. And summarized in a nutshell, they thought to be able to have a single currency uh, without establishing a single economic, financial and political authority. And today we know that they were wrong because, and I repeat myself, there never was a currency and there is no currency in the actual world without a state's authority to guarantee the economic, financial and political conditions to do so. And how could this happen that we have made such a strategic mistake 10 years ago? Well, the founding fathers of the Eurozone set out, I think, the right basic rules. No public debt higher than 60% of the GDP of our, every country that is a member of the Eurozone and no budget deficit lower than 3% of GDP of every uh, member state of the Eurozone. And these basic rules proved to be sound, but I think the founding fathers of the Eurozone made the mistake not to foresee a public authority on the Eurozone level to impose these rules. A public authority strong enough, I should say, to prevent member states to breach the rules. A public authority with the necessary means and tools to, to sanction them, those member states who breach the rules, to penalize the sinners. And the founding fathers of the euro assumed financial and economic discipline within the member states would be strong enough to apply these basic rules. But from the very start of the eurozone in 2002, member states in fact failed to do so. And as long, as long naturally, as economic growth was in the air, the Eurozone could survive this, could survive 
a few sinners. But following the world financial and economic crisis of 2008, the Eurozone, as well as many, as many other countries, got into big trouble because all over the world, but especially in the United States and in the European Union, public authorities pumped billions of dollars and euros into faltering banks and insurance companies. Uh, I give you one figure for the European Union taxpayers. Since 2008, granted aid and provided guarantees of a staggering 4,600 billion euro. That is 6.4 trillion dollar to the financial sector only. And at the same time, public authorities mobilized other billions of dollars and euros to save their economies, to save their jobs. And it was, in my opinion, the real cause for public finances to collapse. This is, in my opinion, is the deepest root of the Eurozone crisis, combined with the absence, still the absence, of a genuine Eurozone authority today, and not the so-called Greek crisis. The Greek crisis is, in my view, only the trigger of all this, not the cause. Portugal and Ireland followed soon, while the Euro crisis is ever closer to destabilize also Spain and Italy. Greece, Portugal and Ireland have relatively small economies, but Italy is the, the third biggest economy within the Eurozone. And Spain the fourth. And, and a Greek default would be a disaster for the Union, but a triple default, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, would be a catastrophe. The Eurozone may not survive. And an additional Italian or Spanish default would be, I should say, an economic and financial earthquake of unseen magnitude, not only for the Union, but for the whole world. So another cause of great concern next to the combined uh, amounts of, of public debt and fiscal deficits are, are the spreads between the member states of the Eurozone. A single currency for 17 member states can, in my opinion, not survive if, if one member state has a, a public debt of 150% of GDP, and that's the case of, uh, of Greece today, while in other member states only bears a debt of 7% of his GDP. That's Estonia today. And the same counts for fiscal deficits, actually ranging from a deficit of 1.7%, that's again Estonia, to a deficit, a fiscal deficit of minus 32% in Ireland. And actually, the most killing spread concerns the differences in interest rates to be paid on long-term bank loans and national public bonds, ranging now from less than 2% for Germany to more than 6% for Italy, 12% for Portugal, 22% for Greece. And yeah, we have to recognize never have the spreads in the bond market been so high before the financial crisis. In 2006, the average spreads measured against the German Bund were 19 basic points, 19 basic points. Today they are above 200 basic points. I'm talking about the average, eh? I'm not talking about Greece because that's more than 2,000 basic points today. So that means 10 times more, and in the case of Greece, 100 times more. So, but ladies and gentlemen, not only do I think we have made strategic mistakes, the last 10 years, I think we also used the wrong method to tackle the problems. We used the weak method, I call it the intergovernmental method, and I think that markets simply do not believe that member states can produce enough discipline and enough solidarity to put together a single currency. And that is what we in fact lack today, more discipline and at the same time more solidarity. So for the first time in recorded history, markets today, and that's uh, very uh, interesting to underline, markets are not asking for more deregulation today. No, they are requesting more unity. More unity in Europe and a transfer of power to the European level and to the European institutions. And to complete my analysis, I think that we also have to recognize that we have made a range of tactical mistakes the last 20 months. We have seen a political leadership in Europe 
that was uh, hesitating, uh, taking half measures, simply uh, reacting to the dramatic facts and events, and uh, foremost lacking a global approach. And that doesn't mean that no decisions were taken. I should say, on the contrary, uh, a European financial stability facility, as you know, the EFSF, or Rescue Fund, has been established. Finally, I should say, approved uh, four weeks ago by the 17 member states of the euro area. A European system of financial supervision has been introduced, including a European systemic risk board and also independent European authorities for banks, for insurances, for occupational pension funds, for securities and for the markets. And um, as you certainly know, on September 28, uh, the European Parliament approved the so-called six-pack, uh, an amended series of European laws to impose a tougher uh, budgetary discipline and to strengthen economic governance within the Eurozone. And for the first of the, uh, the very first time, uh, this package implies European sanctions, European sanctions for member states who do not respect the criteria for their sovereign and fiscal deficits. And finally, also the double summit of, of last week, of the, of the 23rd and the 26th of, uh, of uh, October, uh, took important decisions to cope uh, with the crisis. First, the, as you know, 50% haircut to Greek debt to be written down by banks and creditors, what is, in my opinion, an important step to get uh, Greece back on its uh, feet. And it's also uh, the, the biggest uh, haircut in uh, Western history. It has never been done in the past. Secondly, the additional firepower for the rescue fund, for the EFSF, increasing its amount from uh, more or less 440 uh, billion euro. In reality, it's uh, still 250 uh, billion euro to 1,000 billion euro to, to 1 trillion. And finally, a recapitalization plan requiring banks to hold up to 9% of T1 capital by June 2012, what needs, as we know, more than 106 billion euro of new uh, capital in the next months. So we can say that after nearly two years, because the crisis started not in 2010, they, the crisis started in December 2009. So we can say that after nearly two years, the EU leaders, with their backs against the wall, finally took bold and decisive action. But we have to recognize much work remains to be done. Details of exactly how to boost the firepower of the rescue fund were put off until next month. And I have to tell you, I expressed already publicly my doubts whether the increase of the firepower of the rescue fund is enough. How credible, for example, is it to assure and to give an insurance of 20% if they now decide on a haircut of 50% for Greece? And how much chance to success do this special purpose investment vehicles have, these uh, SPVs that we shall create and in, in which we shall put uh, repackaging uh, the uh, uh, former uh, national bounds of a number of countries. Negotiations between EU officials and the representatives of the banks on the conditions of the write down in Greece's debt still have to be concluded. And moreover, I think the outcome of all this remains unclear, especially also because of the implosion in Greeks' politics. It becomes clearer every day that the political leaders in Greece are not capable of guiding the country out of the crisis as they are still terribly divided. The organization of a referendum, as well as the call for early elections by the opposition, are, in my opinion, irresponsible. At a time when a house is on fire, one should not wonder and ask around if the fire should be extinguished or which firemen should do the job. They should all take up the fire holes and start immediately. The majority, I should say, as well as the opposition, stop fighting, stop the political games, and for, I think, a government of national unity, the fastest as possible in Greece. 
Nevertheless, I think it's also crystal clear today that fueled by the recent events in Greece, the so-called historic summit of the 26th of October did not go far enough, certainly not far enough to restore confidence in the markets. Yes, this double summit took important decisions, but I did not see, uh, how can I call it, genuine breakthroughs, no big banks, no full-range bazooka to overcome the crisis in a lasting way. Yes, the union is moving forward, but we merely still do as we have been doing over the past two years. So waiting, hesitating, crumbling, looting to, uh, looking to one another rather than facing our common challenges. Moving step by step, often going into action too little or too late and only taking tough decisions when the financial markets force us to do so. Financial markets and rating agencies have the member states still in their grip, one by one, notch by notch, pondering what should be done in the German Bundestag and not in the European Parliament. And so this brings me to the essence of my message today. How do we grasp control over this crisis again? And how do we overcome what can become a systemic crisis? Well, I think, and I have been saying this for two years now, we need exactly the opposite of what we have done the last 24 months. What we need urgently, we need as urgent as possible to establish what I call a federal union, a real political and economic union besides the monetary union that we have already since 2001. And secondly, we need a clear and comprehensive roadmap to realize and implement such a federal economic and fiscal union. And thirdly, we need as fast as possible also some temporary urgency measures that remain valid until the federal union has become a reality. Urgency measures that will prevent the crisis from worsening. Again, I think the only way to tackle this crisis with a guarantee of success is to urgently complete the union with a real federal authority. A federal authority that governs the Eurozone as a real economic and fiscal union. And what does this mean? This means, in my opinion, that the deepest root of the Euro crisis had, in fact, not yet been touched. And that is the survival in a union with a single currency of member states as independent and autonomous decision makers on economic and fiscal issues. The last 20 months, we have only narrowed the lines for member states to act, but the fundamental problem still persists. We still have 17 budgets, 17 ministers of finance, 17 national banks, 17 national economies and 17 national economic strategies. And what we urgently need is a single European economic and fiscal framework, a single European government, a government that is responsible for the economic and fiscal policy of the whole Eurozone, and that includes, in my opinion, also a European Minister of Finance, and that includes also a European Monetary Fund, an EMF. And more concretely, I think it's necessary to change the European Commission into a real European executive that sits in the middle of the European decision-making process, and that's the opposite of what is happening now, where we constantly increase the power of the European Council of Heads of States and Government, what has been proved to be insufficient. As we witnessed it, uh, this year, decisions of the European Council take at least three, four months to be ratified, only taking their full effect after ratification. A ratification process that can be stopped by any member state, moreover, I should say, by one Eurosceptic party in a member state. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that we are coping with a financial crisis of unseen magnitude, with financial markets reacting within a few minutes and European decision-making that takes three to four months. And that can simply not work. There is an imbalance between what the markets are doing 
the speed of the markets, and then the other side, the European decision-making process that is too slow. So I repeat, what is necessary is that we transform the European Commission the fastest as possible into a real government of the Union with full powers. And we also need, and that's my second point, just like the United States of America already have since 1790, and that was an initiative from Hamilton, we need also, as the United States of America, a single bond market, a eurobond market. First of all, to close the gap for the unbearable spreads between Europe's national bond markets, European bonds to be guaranteed by all member states of the Eurozone, but at the same time, European bonds collecting private savings more abundant in many European countries than public funds to play a vital role also to finance European recovery. I think that the European bond market is the only way to attract savings from inside and outside Europe. A European bond market we desperately need to finance public debt at the lowest cost, to recapitalize our banks, and at the same time also to finance, uh, finance our investments for future growth. Really, if we want uh, to attract Chinese capital, I think a euro bond market is far more credible than the SPVs, the special purpose vehicles they try to sell right now, at this right, very right moment. A federal economic and fiscal union, European government, a European minister of finance, and a euro bond market. All this together, I think, can break the European deadlock and can overcome the crisis. And only then, when we realize that, when we have decided on that, the markets will know that we are willing to go all the way to save the euro and that uh, the single currency is a real currency uh, which uh, economic and fiscal union and economic and fiscal power behind it. In the meanwhile, as I indicated in the beginning of my intervention, we need also some temporary measures, some urgency measures to empower uh, the means and the tools we have now. We need to make the rescue fund, the EFSF, work properly by abolishing the unanimity rule. A rescue fund based on a unanimity rule is not a real rescue fund. As I indicated already, yeah, then you're completely dependent from yeah, one euro skeptic country. Is it in Finland? Is it in Slovakia? Maybe in another country. Why not uh, putting a system in place like we have in the International Monetary Fund? When it is uh, sufficient uh, to have 85% of the voting rights to decide something. We could imagine the same rule also in the European Rescue Fund. And finally, and maybe more importantly, we need to give the EFSF, the Rescue Fund, access, I should say, temporary access to the means of the European Central Bank. Immedi uh, immediate and practical solutions are now more important than ideological debates on what a central bank should do and cannot do. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking here in Hong Kong and I have given you an overview of what in my opinion is the real cause of this uh, crisis in Europe and what is the way forward. But let's be also a little bit uh, optimist. Europe together, and I s I'm saying that here in, uh, in, 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 in Hong Kong, the entrance port of mainland uh, uh, China, uh, Europe is, is still representing yeah, $16,282 billion of, uh, of uh, gross domestic product. That's um, nearly 26% of the gross world product. Only then followed by the US with 23% of the gross world product. And I compare it always uh, with uh, the Chinese GDP and the Japanese GDP. Notwithstanding the spectacular rise of the so-called BRIC countries, yeah, the US and the EU member states still count for 49%. And I'm always counting then uh, Canada in that club. So that gives me then 52% <laughs> of the uh, world uh, uh, um, product. 
that uh, the US, the EU, and Canada are representing. I'm always uh, putting the question forward, where does the spectacular Chinese growth in global figures come from? Because if you look to the figures, uh, yeah, the US and the EU were stable the last decades. Well, in 1980, the former USSR counted for 11.4% of the gross world product. I think it was an exaggerated figure, as always in the old Soviet Union, because Russia stands today only for 2.3% of the gross world product. So, instead of saying there is no future in the US or in the European Union, I think it is still the European Union a uh, predominant powerhouse. Oh, it could be a, a dominant powerhouse. The biggest difference, in fact, between the US and the EU is that the US is a federal state, having all the prerogatives of a state, and the European Union is not. America has the instruments and the means of a sovereign state, and the European Union has not. And in many aspects, and that's the real cause of our problems, the European Union is still a confederation of semi-independent states and not yet a federal state. And in the EU, vital decisions have still to be taken unanimously by the member states and not by a majority in the Union. Global weight, as I already indicated, is vested into the European Council of Heads of States and Government and not into the normal European institutions, the European Commission as the European government and the European Parliament as the democratic representation of the peoples of Europe. And this difference proves to be crucial today. The public finances in the US are better than the average of the Eurozone. The public debt of the Eurozone is 88% today. It's higher in the US not to compare it with Japan, where it is 226% for the moment. But nevertheless, there is no pressure on the dollar. There is no pressure on Japan. They have a clear sovereign state. They have all the prerogatives of a state. And as I said, although US public debts and US budget deficits are higher than the average of the debts and the fiscal deficits in Europe, yeah, we have to recognize that they are in a better shape than the European Union to survive the ongoing financial crisis. So the only conclusion we can take is that we have to unite Europe. Only a united Europe, a federal Europe, could do the same. And that means finding European solutions for a European crisis. And that is far more than simply coordinating the action of 17 nation states. Solutions no member states can find at home. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.